Hello everyone and welcome to the CircuitPython weekly meeting for January 22nd, 2024. It's that time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. All things. I'm Jeff and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny little computers called microcontrollers. We run on hundreds and hundreds of different microcontroller boards. Um, CircuitPython development is sponsored primarily by Adafruit, so a great way to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and folks like me is by purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. You can also check out the resellers link at the bottom of the page, especially if you are not outside of the US. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can go to adafru.it slash discord to join. You can talk about uh, electronics related stuff any time of day. Uh, but this meeting takes place in the CircuitPython Dev Text channel and the CircuitPython Voice channel, typically on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. In the notes, there is a link to a calendar document so you can check uh, just to make sure that we aren't moving the meeting, usually to a Tuesday uh, in the case of some holidays. Um, the notes document also uh, will have the uh, information that we're reading aloud and talking about during the document, so you can check that out. There will be timestamps if you're viewing or listening after the fact, so you can skip to the parts that you are interested in. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, where we uh, take a few items from the very excellent Python and hardware newsletter curated by our very own Ann Barella, and engineer, um, just to get a sense of what folks on the internet at large are doing with CircuitPython and other Python and hardware topics. The next up is the state of the CircuitPython libraries and Blinka, where we look mostly at some numbers around uh, the project, mostly statistics from GitHub. Then y'all get to participate with me. We roll into Hug Reports, which is an opportunity to highlight the great stuff that folks in the community are doing. Um, and that recognition is super important and it really, uh, it's a great part of, of the week when we get to recognize each other like that. Then is the meat and potatoes called Status Updates. Uh, we take the opportunity to report what we've been up to since the last meeting and what we'll do in the next week or until the next meeting. And finally, uh, we have a section called In the Weeds, and that is for long-form discussion. If you have anything that you know needs kind of a back and forth, want to talk to uh, some of your peers, get direction or get advice, that is the place to do it. Um, and so for those hug reports and status updates, add your info to the notes doc, as well as In the Weeds, uh, just so that we can get to each item as, uh, yeah, as it comes up. And with that, I will transition over to telling you about community news. So I just picked a couple of items today. Uh, first up, Thea Flowers is the new Oshawa board president. The Open Source Hardware Association, Oshawa, welcomes Thea Stargirl Flowers as the new Oshawa board president. As many members of the Oshawa community already know, Thea is a creative technologist and passionate open source advocate. She's creator of the Winterbloom open source synthesizers, many of which are Oshawa certified. Thea is also creator of Kai Canvas, a maintainer of CircuitPython, and a former Python Software Foundation fellow. Oh, and she recently redesigned the Certification Mark brand guide. And there are some links in the notes doc about that. And thank you, Tim, for showing us some of those links live in the Discord. The other item I picked, um, and disclaimer, this is my, my item here that uh, Anne chose to spotlight. The Adafruit Playground is a new place for the community to post their projects and other making tips, tip, tips, ticks, tips, tricks, and techniques ad free. It's an easy way to publish your work in a safe space for free. And uh, Anne featured my programming a Unicom Mini M keyboard with CircuitPython. And I'll just tell you a tiny bit more about that. Uh, some of the models of newly manufactured buckling spring keyboards from Unicom have uh, Raspberry Pi Pico inside as the controller. And uh, you have to briefly pop it open to access the uh, boot select button, and then you can load whatever firmware on it you want. And it, it's super cool. It's like the best off the shelf keyboard you can buy to put CircuitPython on, in my opinion. So had fun putting that page together. So a little more about what the newsletter is. There's a lot more in this newsletter. I just picked a couple of items that were interesting to me. The Python on Microcontrollers Weekly Newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuitpython. And by the way, the front page of adafruitdaily.com is where you go to subscribe. 
Uh, it highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. And as Ann B points out, she wants your news. Uh, we really want to feature uh, the community, everybody who's working with these uh, technologies. So you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. You can uh, tag your post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or X, formerly known as Twitter. Or you can even go direct to GitHub and edit the draft of next week's newsletter because we developed this thing like so much of our software out in the open. Um, yeah, so do a project with CircuitPython, with MicroPython, with Python on a Raspberry Pi. Let us know and we will, we will promote it because we, um, we love sharing and promoting your stuff. And that is the community news. Next is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. And uh, Dan, Tim, Melissa, if you uh, can't read your normal section, just let me know. Uh, but otherwise, I will assume that you can grab those. So uh, we grab statistics mostly from GitHub that cover the last week of activity, uh, seven times 24 hours more or less, and then kind of give you an abstract of that. So overall, we had 21 pull requests merged from 18 authors, which is a super healthy number. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, try and read these names here that are less frequently seen. Ram Key, Josh Korn, Adam Cummick, US3R64, TLYU, Karel Crows, James Bowman, Creeder, Side Spoiler M, Salam Cytron, Asma Gill, uh, there's just a tremendous number of names here that are, are newer and frequent contributors, and I really appreciate that. Um, as well, we had five reviewers, thanks to the usual team, as well as Cryer and Retired Wizard. And um, with that, Dan, if you're able to, I will let you take the core section. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in the core, over the past week, we had 12 poll requests merged by 13 authors. Um, there were five reviewers. And we now have 23 open pull requests. That's down from, I think, 28 last week, which is good. Um, there were eight issues closed by five people and six open by six people. So a small improvement, but basically uh, keeping the same rate. We have almost 700 open issues. There are eight active milestones. That's how we keep track of which issues should be fixed by when. There are a couple of issues for the 10.0 version. Those are just reminders to us of things to change when we start working on 10.0, which will be a while. Uh, there aren't any open issues right now for 8.2 something. There are 53 open issues that are currently assigned to 9.0. Um, there are nine issues assigned to 9xx. That is something later than 9.0. 24 issues open that have to do with libraries, 584 long-term issues, which might be bugs or might be enhancement requests, uh, 17 open issues for support reasons, 11 issues for third-party reasons, that is, we, we need to depend on a third party to do something before that issue can progress. And right now, we don't have any issues that are not assigned a milestone, because I did a bunch of triage on Saturday. Okay, that's it. And thank you for that triage, Dan. That is really helpful. Uh, and next up, Tim will tell us about the libraries. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section covers the CircuitPython libraries, which are Python level code that allows you to interact with various different pieces of hardware or provide helper functionality uh, so that you don't have to manage uh, as many of the nitty gritty details at your uh, project code level. Um, all these libraries can be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, uh, and then the name of whatever library it is. Uh, across all of those libraries this week, we had nine pull requests merged by five authors. Uh, and actually, most of these are names that I don't necessarily recognize as super frequent contributors. So thanks to uh, Carol Croes, uh, James Bowman, Adam Kamik, uh, As McGill, and User64, uh, who might be either newer or less frequent contributors. Uh, thanks to all those folks this week. Uh, we did have two reviewers, so thanks to Dan and Scott for doing some library reviews this week. Uh, of the nine pull requests that were merged, the oldest one was 27 days. The handful of the newest ones were all just one day. That leaves us, after the week, with 51 pull requests open. 
Uh, the oldest of which is 522 days, and the newest is nine days. Um, over the past seven days, we had five issues closed by two people, with seven new issues opened by seven people. Uh, that leaves us with 721 issues that are opened. And of those, uh, there are 19 of them that are labeled Good First Issues, uh, which you can find listed over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, uh, which is the website where you can go if you want to get started, uh, involve, uh, if you want to get involved with the CircuitPython project contributing code. Um, so at circuitpython.org slash contributing, you'll find a list of the open PRs across all these libraries. If you're looking uh, to uh, get started with testing and things like that, you can try out those PRs, uh, run it on hardware if you've got the hardware. Otherwise, just look over the code for syntax, uh, spelling, etc. cetera. Uh, leave comments to let us know that you uh, looked it over. And uh, if you do that for a bit and get comfortable with it, we can level you up to the review team so that you can leave uh, sort of official reviews over on GitHub. Uh, if you're interested in contributing code or documentation, you can also check out the open issues right on that contributing page. Uh, there are tabs across the top um, to change between PRs and issues. And once you do click over to the issues tag, there's also a drop down filter that you can use to filter all those issues by tags, including that good first issue tag, which is the one that uh, has been identified for issues that are best for folks who maybe don't have as much experience or um, you know, don't require uh, as complex things um, typically in those issues. So look for those if you want to get started. Um, and then let's see, if you need help with Git or GitHub, we have guides available for that. And uh, there's also always folks available here on the Discord to help you out. So uh, uh, we're you know looking for help from anybody. If you want to get involved, don't be uh, intimidated by the process. We've got help and helpful people around uh, to help you contribute in whatever way works best for you. Um, the uh, library uh, PyPI stats this week, we had 140,254 downloads of the 324 libraries. Uh, the top 10 is listed out here, as is uh, the list of libraries that were updated in the last seven days here in the note stock, if anybody would like to take a look at those. And that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. As always, thank you. And next up to round out this section, Melissa will tell us about what's going on with Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry, and uh, other single board computers like the Raspberry Pi. And this week we had zero pull requests merged. Uh, there are currently eight open pull requests amongst all the repositories. Um, there were zero closed issues by zero people and three open by three people, uh, leaving a net of 81 open issues. I think a lot of those are actually new board requests. Um, there were 13,256 PyPI downloads in the last week, 5,427 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 128 supported boards. And that's it. Thank you. Now it is time for uh, the community to start participating. We are going to start the Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list in the notes document order to give everybody a chance to participate. And of course, if you're text only or missing the meeting, I will read out the notes when I get to them in the list, as I will with a couple of folks um, as we go through. All right, so um, I just have a group hug, but then I have some specific hugs. Uh, TAC, our uh, tiny USB developer, and another user called Kitiam for writing UVC support in tiny USB, and I'll tell you a little bit more about UVC down in status updates. Uh, a hug for an engineer for featuring an Adafruit Playground note that I wrote in the newsletter. And finally, Tanu, uh, thank you for your helpful review comments on bitmap filter. I think the documentation is in a much better place um, than, than I had gotten it to as a result of your reviews. So really appreciate that. <clears throat> Next, I have some notes from C. Grover, who's text only. Uh, C. Grover has a hug for Fumi Guy for another action-packed deep dive that spawned a few new ideas and knowledge. And for Ross Grady on GitHub for finding and correcting a typo in the AD9833 library frequency sweep example. 
And next we'll hear from Dan and DJ Devon 3. Okay, uh, thanks to you, Jeff, for working on uh, UVC um, USB video. That's what your webcam uses to send video, and we're going to do the same thing in CircuitPython. So uh, Jeff will talk about that later. And thanks to Lady Ada, who has come pretty much uh, come really close to completing redesigning so many boards, like about five or six hundred, to accommodate parts changes uh, since the great parts shortage, and then since then. So uh, that's a massive um, uh, redesign task, and. Now she can get on to more um, new boards of some kind, which she's been doing already, but she'll have more time for new boards. And that's it. All right. Uh, take it away, DJ Devon 3. Uh, thank you. I have a hug for Foamy Guy for creating the foundation of the soft keyboard library. Thank you for letting me work on it with you. It's been a great learning experience and a lot of fun. Um, a hug to Toddbot for helping field questions in CircuitPython subreddit. While it's not a primary means for CircuitPython support, people do go there for help sometimes, and Toddbot provides great advice there too. Um, while it's not as easy as Discord, it is possible to, to post code snippets on Reddit for answering code questions. And a group hug. All right, next up I have notes from 88CC, uh, who says, Big congratulatory hug to Dan H., for finding the open source software code for the faulty Sonoma MS DOS FS. And next we've got uh, Tim and then Katni. All right, uh, for my hug reports this week, thanks to David Glauda, uh, Justin, and DJ Devon3, uh, all for conversation and, and ideas uh, and discussion on Discord around the uh, Pac Man game that I was working on on a couple of streams over the weekend. Uh, thanks as well to DJ Devon3 for adding a new example to the soft keyboard library, as well as doing some cleanup of the uh, old bits of code that I left in there. Um, thanks to you, Jeff, for submitting the bitmap filter. I think that uh, looks pretty cool. I'm excited to give it a try over in the core. And uh, group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. And next up is Katni, who we're always happy to see. Hello. Uh, so I have a hug for Foamy Guy for coming up with a terribly clever solution for a potential project I may be helping a friend's sister with and for writing up a demo of that solution. To Jeff for answering a question about the same project. To Melissa for some lovely chats. To Jeff again for some different lovely chats. And to Paul Cutler for some even different or lovely chats. And to everyone for continuing to make CircuitPython great and a group hug. All right, Paul, just take a note that your chats were the most different out of all of us. So you have something special going on there, I think. All right, and next up is Maker Melissa. Ha, uh, let's see, I have a uh, hug report for uh, Katni for some great and much needed chats and a group hug to everyone else. All right, and rounding out the section, it is Scott Tanute. Hello. Um, first, a hug to Foamy Guy and all the deep divers for flexibility when I had to bail kind of last minute on the last week's deep dive. I look forward to doing it, but uh, having a sick kiddo or a, a kiddo in daycare means that it's not always uh, easy to plan ahead. So thanks to everyone for their flexibility around that. And then uh, Fede2 dropped a note in the keyboards channel in Discord. I thought this was really cool. Um, they're promoting a Costa Rican layout for keyboards so that uh, it can better support both native Costa Rican languages, English and Spanish, I believe is what he said. So that that's super cool. Um, good work. I'll have to check that out. I'm interested in that sort of thing just from an academic standpoint. That's on the Discord somewhere? It's in the keyboards channel, I think. I will check that out there. after the meeting. Cool. All right, that concludes Hug Reports, so it's time for status updates. It's time to tell folks what we're up to, kind of on an individual basis. I'll start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I get to you, uh, take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been up to since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until our next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide a quick tip or trick relevant to what people are talking about. But if the discussion is long, uh, we will move it to In the Weeds. And with that, I will get us started. So um, I was working recently on adding some uh, bitmap manipulation features, kind of image filters, to CircuitPython. That's called bitmap filter, and the pull request was merged. 
Uh, that's going to be on a couple of the like the ESP32 boards, particularly with camera support, and especially the Pi Camera uh, Memento board. And then I got a good start on UVC support for CircuitPython. As Dan was saying, this is the protocol that uh, lets video cameras operate on USB. And what we are looking at doing in CircuitPython is allowing you to treat it as a display I.O. display. Where that's at right now is um, you can import UVC and access a bitmap object inside of there, and the pixels that you assign to that bitmap are shown on a camera app that runs on your computer and it updates in real time. And that's kind of cool. It proves that the, the technology works. Um, great foundations, as I was saying, laid by TAC in TinyUSB uh, to make this work. Uh, but that's not super useful, so we need to hook it up to Display.io, and that's the next step. Um, and probably when we get to that point, I will pull request it, um, although if anybody is interested, I can point you at my branch. Or if you just snoop into my fork of, of CircuitPython and look at the recently updated branches, you'll find it. Um, so that is basically what's up next, is continuing to work on this uh, new kind of display that will display onto a host computer. Um, and it needs to work with display I.O. It needs to allocate the frame buffer memory um, dynamically so that if this is enabled but not used, it doesn't use up uh, valuable RAM. Um, and also, I've been testing it on the RP2040 to start with, um, and I need to return to testing it on the Espressive boards, particularly on the um, Memento Pi camera. And uh, another feature that would be nice is to allow boot.py to set the UVC display resolution. Um, right now it's set up to do 128 by 96 pixels, and you get a frame rate of 10 frames per second, which is, you know, it's fine for some things. Uh, but for instance, one scenario we're thinking of is you want to produce um, a, a mock-up or a documentation image of what will be shown on a CircuitPython device. You would want to configure it with the same pixel resolution as your real display just to get um, a real idea of what that's looking like. So uh, those are kind of the things that need to be added before it's really super useful. And then the other thing I'll be working on this week is the bitmap filter pull request is merged, but there are no examples of using it. And so I will add some examples, probably to the CircuitPython Pi Camera repository. Um, I'm planning a new example, which will open JPEGs from your SD card and then apply random filters to them as a kind of another uh, photo album um, concept. Um, and then there is going to be a page on the Learn system that um, also talks about if you need a high performance filter that you will you want to write in C code in CircuitPython, how do you do that? Um, and so that that is what is up uh, continuing and concluding bitmap filter. And that is what I'm up to. Uh, so then I have notes from C. Grover who writes, uh, I am reworking the WaveViz library to take advantage of the open polygon option in both display shapes and bitmap tools. It should improve performance and greatly simplify the current code. And now we've got uh, notes from Dan. What's up, Dan? Okay, so I've been working on issues for the 900 release. Um, Jeff, Scott, and I will have a triage meeting to go over the bug list again uh, soon. Um, I started working on something, uh, we, well, on the NRF port, we use a layer called NRFX, which is kind of a thin layer that um, provides some drivers and control over the actual de devices on the chip. And I wanted to update that to add some, an I2C timeout. It's possible for the I2C bus to get hung, and right now software in NRFX doesn't handle that. So I started updating that in preparation for that, and it turned out there were many, many, many changes because we hadn't updated for years. And it became more complicated and there would be a lot of testing and I decided maybe I'll put this off until after 900. So uh, I checked in what I had or I, in my own uh, fork of CircuitPython and I'll come back to that. Then I started looking at a couple of bugs that have to do with language features which um, are causing errors on language constructs that seem to be okay. One of those bugs was, um, turns out, what uh, has already found in MicroPython, and I gave them a slightly, an example that caused a sort of a worse problem, a crash, but mainly we would depend on MicroPython to fix that because it requires changes 
in the um, at the MPY level. Um, there's another bug which I looked at, and it turns out it's been in existence since 500, Circuit Python 500. So maybe we won't. That's not so urgent, even though it would be nice to fix it. Um, but I'll see if it's easy to fix. And then finally, um, you've all heard about the um, Sonoma, uh, the Mac OS Sonoma problem in which um, writes to small fat disk drives like the CircuitPy drive are delayed. And in particular, it's not even that all the writes are delayed, it's that it does some of the writes, waits a long time, like tens of seconds, and then finishes the write. So this the uh, file system is in an inconsistent state for a very long time, and this upsets CircuitPython greatly when it tries to do um, uh, auto reload, or even if it were trying to read files and a program was running while you were writing a file, that would also be bad. So uh, we've reported, a number of us have reported this to, or a number of other people have reported this up to Apple several, several times on each uh, release of Sonoma betas, and it still hasn't been fixed. They're about to come out with Sonoma 14.3, and it's still not fixed. I wrote up an Apple feedback item, which I had not done myself, and suggested to them I could give them harder where if they wanted to test it. But then um, somebody said, oh, it's this software component someone who's been working on this in our bug list and um, a user. And I Googled that that, and managed, it seems like I may have found the actual source code that is this new code that is causing the problem. I mean, I haven't looked at the code at all, but I was surprised that this was open source code, but it seems to be. So we have to, we have to start looking at that and maybe we can give them even more hints. There's also somebody's name in the code, which might help. So maybe we won't try to bug that person immediately. And that's it. All right, next up, DJ Devon 3. Hello. Hello, and thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I think we probably don't necessarily want to name this person while we don't know, you know, the exact status of things. Um, this possible Apple engineer, I, I think we probably don't want to say that. But anyway, go ahead, Devon. Okay. Uh, this week I added the ability to use different JSON file layouts with CircuitPython soft keyboard. Uh, Foamy Guy did the initial one, but it was only using one file layout, so I've made it possible to now use multiple f file layouts, which is good for people that have other languages. So you can have the soft touch keyboard in whatever language you want or whatever layout that you want. Um, currently working on the special character switch mode for the mobile layout, so it looks and acts more like an iOS mobile layout. Uh, this is the first library I've helped code and have learned a lot about what self does and how it relates to implementing class parameters and functions. Uh, this week I also submitted a PR to Adafruit CircuitPython display button to add a sprite button simple test for the TFT Featherwing touch display. Improve the simple test button debounce a little bit thanks to an example by GitHub user LCMC Ninch. The display button library is a great way to add touch buttons to any touch capable display. That's it. Sounds good. Um, I've got some notes from ADCC. I've been a bit under the weather for the last couple of weeks, but continuing to work on BLEIO for RP2. Sorry this is taking so long. Every bug I get past seems to have a dozen more hiding behind it. No idea how much longer this will take, but I am in it for the long haul. And I think everybody who has developed software has sympathy for for feeling that way, but um, we know you'll get through it. Um, yeah. And then I have notes from Fede2, who writes, adding a Costa Rica keyboard to the Unicode CLDR standard that will allow manufacturers to build a keyboard for this country that will allow anyone to write not only in Spanish and English, but also in native languages use it in public education system, etc. And maybe making a CNC for building custom music instrument strings. Ping me if you have a string instrument with special needs. And this is fascinating and I, I don't have any need for it, but I would love to know more. All right, and next up is Tim. All right, uh, this past week I 
uh, validated an issue on e-ink displays uh, that results in them not refreshing after you have put something onto them. And I uh, created and uh, posted up a little small contained reproducer that exhibits that issue, at least on the uh, mag tag. And um, I'll probably dig further um, once I get finished up with my current project. Um, the other thing that I did aside from that uh, main project this week was in the soft keyboard, a uh, little bit of fixing in there. I had left some uh, old code in there that actually was causing it to raise exceptions. And then the version that was on my device was already fixed, but I didn't realize the difference was there. So I got that fixed in the repo so that it actually uh, can run without raising exceptions. Um, and thanks to uh, DJ Devin who pointed that uh, issue out to me. Um, and then the main thing that I've been working on this week is the a game that I'm calling 1D Chomper, which runs on the Qualia display driver and uses one of the really long um, and narrow displays. The code is getting pretty darn close to complete. Um, I think the main thing that I really want to do that's not in the code yet is just uh, have the difficulty increase the longer you play so that it starts to kind of speed up and get a little bit harder. Um, but the, uh, the rest of the actual functionality of the code is done, and I even did a bunch of work this morning cleaning it up and commenting it up, so it's in a, a really good state. Uh, I've also designed some decals that I'm going to use to stick on a cardboard box that's going to house the game, uh, and I'm going to print those out on the uh, decal paper and try to get them stuck on and cut the holes that are needed uh, this afternoon after the meeting, and then uh, I'll be getting... Uh, going on the guide uh, to write that out this week, and then um, I'm hoping to stop by Show and Tell on Wednesday to show uh, the current state. So that's what I've got for this week. Thanks. All right, thank you. And next up is Katni. Hi. Hello. So I have been dealing with being low to medium grade sick for over three weeks now, which has been sapping most of my energy. Um, I agreed to be conference chair for Pi Ohio 2024, the venue search for which has been taking up most of what energy I have left. Um, I'm super excited to be doing this though, and so far it's been a fascinating learning experience in event planning and conference organizing in which I have no previous experience. Um, I ordered a 7.3 inch inky frame from Pimeroni, it's a um, board that has a Pico W on it and um, a giant uh, seven color e-ink and some buttons. Um, and it should be here Thursday. I see there's a PR open for adding it to CircuitPython, but it doesn't include the PS RAM, which there's an extra PS RAM chip on it, uh, which is something I'm interested in. The PR is listed as minimally viable by the author. I have no idea how to implement PS RAM. Um, I also don't know whether that PR is a good place to start if I wanted to finish that project. Maybe worth putting in the weeds instead of here. Um, Still getting arbitrary reboots on a circuit Python project that is a feather running three 0.5 meter LED strips. I haven't added code to tell it to stop rebooting, uh, which might help um, yet, but I also realized the microcontroller has been resting on a metal surface and now I'm wondering if that's what's been causing the problem. So I propped it up on plastic um, and I'll see if that helps. Um, I can move my, my comment into the weeds though. Uh, yeah, sure. That's probably for the best. I know that the that microcontroller doesn't have like built-in support for PSRAM, so it's not like it is on Espressif where you just enable it in a configuration. But anyway, yeah, we can right. uh, head on and uh, hear from okay. Maker Melissa. Uh, hello. Um, so I've been testing out hardware on the Raspberry Pi 5 and Bookworm. Um, I've been updating scripts that need updating and working on creating new overlays for the Pi TFTs that use the tiny DRM drivers. I've been uh, updating the P Pi TFT installer script as well. And um, after some of them, some more overlays are added, I'll be updating the guides. And that's it. Thank you. And now we come to Scott. Hi again. Hello. Um... So I was out Friday because Ari got his first stomach flu, which I got last night, which is so fun. Um, I'm, I'm uh, feeling a lot better, but I'm still not 100%, so I am taking it easy today. Uh, and maybe tomorrow, depending on how I feel. Uh, I have a PR for the SD cards over Wi-Fi and Beely. It's super close. I look, there's four boards that are still too big. 
and the the one that's is 60 bytes over so i'm going to still try to figure out how i can get 60 bytes back on the samd 21 uh, that's super fun as well <laughs> uh, we'll keep digging into that and then the next thing on my list is um, jerry did a really helpful issue for uh, looking into memory errors on the esp32 s2 with two megs uh, ps ram where the examples used to work in 8x and they don't work 9.0 so i'm going to take a look at that uh, as well all right, thank you. And that wraps up status updates. Next, we've got In the Weeds, an opportunity for these longer discussions um, that we need to have sometimes. If you do have a topic that uh, you want to discuss, please do add it now. And I'm just going to take these couple of topics in the order that we have them. So, uh, Justin, hello, welcome. I know you've been waiting a couple of weeks to bring this up. And now that uh, some more folks are back from vacation and being low-grade sick and all those things, uh, I'm glad to see that you are here. So go ahead. And, uh, I, I've also been fighting the low-grade sick, so I totally understand how it is. Um, and also trying to come up with new ideas over a holiday and such. Um, so a handful of you guys have um, been there helpful to kind of make some comments as I've worked through some of this. Um, I don't know the best way to kind of move forward at this point, um, but it kind of started with this conversation that I had um, with DG73 of some request issues. They're actually something that I saw again over the weekend with another user um, and people basically reinitializing the socket pool and such and was like, there should be a better way to do this. And so kind of came up with this original idea of a socket manager that then kind of that lived inside the request library and then kind of moved out of there as kind of some initial comments into a new library called connection manager um, that would is more of a singleton and that way, even if you reinit something, it doesn't reinit itself, which means if you have open connections and things like that. The references to those aren't lost and whatnot. So at this point, just trying to figure out if this is a direction that people want to go. Um, there is a PR out there for the main one. Um, Filming guy played with it a few weeks ago, which was awesome to watch him kind of struggle through it a little bit and then kind of the changes for um, currently what's in requests and um, MQTT. And there's lots of things I'd want to update still currently, docs and tests and things like that um, that I haven't just because I don't want to spin a bunch of wheels that um, if people don't want to kind of move this, move forward with it. So kind of open it up to the group at this point. Um, and maybe that's just a bunch of people committing to saying, yep, I'm happy to go look at this over X period of time and we can go back to it. Um, I'm definitely not in a rush to get this done, um, but um, I've been using a bunch of my devices and I love it at this point. So um, yeah, I'll stop there and see what people want to say and kind of go from there. Thank you. Um, I would say I'm definitely interested in pursuing uh, this kind of way of doing the API with this kind of manager layer that tries to uh, minimize the differences between the different ways of connecting to the network. Um, I didn't, uh, I, I actually meant to do it and it looks like I've forgotten. I was just looking back over the original PR. Um, so I didn't post anything on there, but like Justin mentioned, I did try this out a couple of weeks back. I don't know if there were changes since then, but um, I was definitely liking what I was seeing on the requests and the M, uh, mini MQTT side of things. Um, it was looking good. We tried out both uh, on a built-in Wi-Fi device, probably like an ESP32 S2 TFT or something. And then we also tried on the Pi Portal um, for the ESP32 Spy try to think, uh, side of things. And um, I don't have uh, necessarily specific feedback as, as far as um, things to change or, or directions to go, but I would say I'm definitely liking uh, where it's headed and I'm interested in seeing it continue. If from a support perspective, I see a lot of people who use, try to use the um, learn guide documentation, learn guides, they use ESP32 spy, but then use it with something that's not in airlift like um nesp 32 you know matrix portal s3 or something like that and they can't 
figure out why the code that they took from the ESP32 spy isn't working on the module, or vice versa. I mean, it happens both ways. Uh, so it's something that just takes all of it and wraps it all into one just connection method that's the same across all learn guides, I think would be just better just for support perspective, let alone easily usable in the future. And going forward, you can put all future connection methods into that same connection manager. Now, I think it's a good thing overall. Yeah. And to add kind of one piece, it's on the PR if you look at it. And I need to update it because I've changed a little bit. But even the thought process of building into the connection manager a method that um, you pass a radio, so Wi Fi radio or the ESP instance, or um, I was I forget what it's called because I don't use it enough, but the, the physical connection one. Um, and then it returns automatically uh, both the pool and the SSL context, um, which greatly then minimizes the amount of imports users need to do. And they can basically just init whatever the radio is they have. And then this library, we just keep updating if there are other ones. Um, it's definitely not a requirement, but it would definitely sim simplify learn guides quite a bit. Um, and then especially as people add more functionality, that can be updated. And so learn guides don't need to get need to be updated as frequently as well. So Dan or Scott, do either of you um, have comments to add to this? I haven't done a super deep dive into it. Um, I did look at like the pending MQT mini MQTT change, I think. Generally, like it's nice that you're like removing code like yeah, my first impression was like it. It seemed like the right way to do it. Um, I think more broadly, this has me thinking about whether we, whether we took the wrong approach with network support in the first place. Um, whereas like MicroPython, you kind of install the adapters and then it manages it internally. But um, instead of like having socket pool, which is a unique thing to CircuitPython. Um, but yeah, I think generally yeah, it's a green light for me. Like it's still it's still an improvement um, in the short term for sure, if not the long term. The other thing to think about would be the WizNet libraries, because I know the the Python WizNet library is actually like pretty often used now. It is pretty often used. I think I've so. Never... I see. I see a lot of people like working on it. Um, I don't use it myself, but it seems like there are definitely folks that do. Yeah, and there are people who are pretty, who are doing it, using it professionally or something, or semi-professionally, so they, they're kind of inclined to fix things. Um, do you do you see this as like a 10-0 thing? Like this, this sort of like, when you say, what do you mean by uh, installing the adapter? Like, it's just, just say like, oh, I wouldn't even say it's a 10.0 thing. It's just a, a long term thing. Okay. I like a, a deviation from MicroPython that I'm not sure was the best. Uh huh. Do you think, that, you know, something in the back of my mind, but yeah. But I does that mean that I want to put the effort into it? Probably not. <laughs> and is the connection manager moving? It's moving in that direction. Like, well, yeah, it's filling that hole, right? It's kind of what I'm thinking of. Was like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I still don't know because I think part of the reason, part of the thing I was trying to avoid is like if you have, you know, like a Python level level driver for network, then you're kind of secretly crawling it under the hood, kind of like the SD card stuff already does. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. MicroPython is still. They're very interested in writing a lot of low level code in Python and even calling back from C to Python, which we. Right. And it's just right. Yeah. Right, which I think is generally a really good thing for the project. Like, I think MicroPython and CircuitPython are better for, for like Damien and and Jim's desire to do that because um, yeah. they're pushing Python boundary. And I think it's funny that I kind of find find myself in the opposite boat where I'm like, no, I'm okay writing more C. I think the 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 strong line I would draw is if it's Python code that's being called by an interrupt, then that that really throws me off. But if it's 
Python code that calls C code that then calls Python code again, maybe that's okay. But it's still weird to me. Anyway, Justin, I, I think you're going the right direction. And I saw your MPY numbers, and I wonder if your MPY numbers would be better uh, simply if you remove the typing information, because I don't know if MPY is... MPY cross is smart enough to like remove the code that falls under that test for whether it's circuit Python or not. Yeah, and I did do a second push on that and just imported the typing from the connection manager into requests since it depends on it anyway, and that dropped it down a little bit more and it's a lot closer. Um, I had just moved over the typing because it was in requests originally. I think the question would be if that's something like well, the type annotations get discarded, but the actual import logic doesn't. Yeah, so okay. specifically the code in request has a lot of custom logic around like merging a bunch of types together and things like that. So that would still kind of hang around. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I know that, you know, definitely like it's one of those spaces versus tabs things. Some people love typing, some people mm -hmm. hate it. And like, I'm, ha you know, like, I haven't done enough in Circuit Python to know like where people start running out of space and things like that. If it matters, kind of my original thing was just like, "Hey, look, I'm I'm adding this, and we're not the amount of space we're taking up is nominal. Um, okay. Obviously, if we add some of the more automatic, determine what's the you know the pool and things like that, it would get a little bit bigger. So it's kind of like whether right. or not you guys want that carried over or not. Obviously, very easy to cut out if people don't want it in there. So. Right. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is uh, something like a Pika W or like a even like an M zero with ESP thirty two spy. Like, there's definitely like those weird cases where you don't have a lot of RAM that you're working with. Like the espressive chips are not really the the ones that you want to test on when you're worried about memory. Yeah, M zero is the is the the really that's the test for anything that's constrained space constrained. Yeah, and maybe even like the M M four matrix portal, like where it's got, you know, the ESP next to it on the same board. Yeah, that's I don't more memory. Any, I'm, okay. any M zero, even any guides that use M zero plus, airlet. Right. So right. I'm not sure I'm worried about that. So, I mean, I think the way we can review this, I think the test is kind of like. We have to have people who are trying all these changes together, um, and it it, ha does, it has to be a big bang kind of change, right? Like all the libraries have to change at the same time, or could, for instance, we defer the mini MQTT changes um, so it's just request. Justin, like it, 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 it like. Could we publish this library? I mean, the library can stand alone, and it, we can we can move it into under the Adafruit organization because it would be part of that. And then um, you could you can reassign it to us or something. You can reassign the, the ownership to us. And then the question is, okay, then after it's really tested thoroughly, then we can do uh, change all the library simultaneously overnight. And then we also have to go back and change the guides to point out that you need these new things. Yeah, so, and I'm totally happy to do, like, I started this, I'm happy to finish it to whatever level. I, you know, if you guys can point me to, like, I obviously haven't done the stuff with the guides, but I'm happy to change all the guides. If you guys want to do one at a time and just do requests, like, we can totally do that as well. Um, you know, could even just add this first. And so get it to a point where a majority of the people have it in the library when they download it before you do it. Like I'm like, as far as how you guys release and handle complicated changes like this, like that's kind of more up to you. Like I download tons of read guides and been like, oh, I need to add this library. I need to add this library. But of course I've also been a Python developer for over 20 years and it's not hard for me to be like, oh, missing this import, I know where to find it. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other people will be like, I don't know what to do. 
do you do you see also changes that you want to make an ESP32 SPI library, or that's um, that's separate? So the so the only change that I that I kind of would recommend making in so there's kind of two pieces. One, I I would love that all things, whether it's Wi-Fi or ESP32 SPI or the WizNet or whatever, that they all had a similar like connect method. Yeah. And that way we could, then the next step would be, it would be easier to automate. And that way everything was just always like, oh, connect or is connected. So those are things we could add and slowly depreciate the other methods when we saw fits. Um, and then my next goal would be trying to get work on those to get them all the way up to par. For example, you can't use the NTP library anymore with the SP32 because some of the methods that it needs aren't there anymore. You know, and granted that one has get time, but like that then makes it hard for people. I don't know what your guys' goal is to basically be like, oh, we don't care what chip you use. You know, this stuff should work everywhere. So if you pick up, you know, as for Ford, it's going to work great. Or if you pick up an M4 and throw on an airlift, it's also going to work. Um, like, I think my goal would be to get them as similar. And so it wouldn't matter what hardware people had chosen or had right. lying around. That's our goal too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my change to TSB 32 would be to try to get some, get it closer and just regular socket connections to Wi Fi and then also have similar connection methods and things like that. And also for the WizNet, which I have, I just need to solder my headers on and then I can start doing some testing on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that, I think we can review this and then start testing it in earnest with several things and, and, and see how that works out. And also whether it affects, I don't know whether it would affect HTTP server or not. So that's another thing to look at also. So. Um, when, when we get a little more free time, I hope soon, like in a couple of weeks or something, maybe I could spend some time uh, looking at this. And there are plenty of people who use it, all this stuff a lot more than I do also, who, who, who could test it. So even if there's a gap, don't think there's lack of interest. It's just a matter of kind of scheduling working on it, um, figuring out when the best time to work on it is. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to um, kind of move us ahead to Katni's topic because uh, she has another obligation soon. So uh, Katni, why don't you take it away with your item? All right. So uh, as I said earlier, I ordered a 7.3 inch Inky frame. Um, there's a PR open for, in, for uh, the board definition for it for CircuitPython. Um, it doesn't include the not onboard PS RAM that's on the on the like Inky frame itself. Um, I don't have any idea how to implement that, um, which really I don't have any idea how to implement any PS RAM. But uh, I also don't know whether this PR is a good place to um, to start with this, just because I don't know whether it's been. Um, reviewed at all or if you know the whether it makes sense to start with that information and you know try to move forward with that or or what and i guess i want to know if if anybody has a general idea how to implement this whether it's something that is even remotely possible for me to do uh so so like I was saying, um, the, the RP2040 microcontroller doesn't like directly support PS RAM, so it's going to be like, it's just kind of a, a spy device or a quad spy device, and it would need mm -hmm. some kind of driver. Uh, but you know, it's not going to be able to, for instance, store a CircuitPython list because it's not really memory to the microcontroller, it's something else, it's like storage or... Uh, uh, an SD card, but you lose the contents when you turn it off. So I'm not really sure exactly oh. how you would end up using it. Um, I would look at what have they done, like have they provided a MicroPython module that somehow interacts with this and understand, you know, their their idea of how is this, how does this work? 
um, okay. and see if that makes any sense with CircuitPython or not. But yeah, I'll let All you read right. off DJ Devon's question. Oh, uh, sure, I don't have an answer, though. Is the amount of PSRAM specified in the board config, or is that just flash storage? Um, it's I, Nothing's really in CircuitPython yet, so I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I would encourage you to start with the PR and see if you can do everything you need there. Um, start with the reason... Way. Although that comment says this doesn't work yet on my inky frame, so it, I, I don't okay. know, it may well, not I, be working. Well, it's still yeah. a place to start, I guess. I mean, right. So start with the existing pull request, Scott. Yeah, start with the existing okay. pull request, and I did actually. Let me find it. I did a, a a driver for it as well. Like, there's a there's a driver for it that you could run just with the Pico W firmware. Okay. Um, it just wouldn't have like the board dot display. But you can import something and create the display. Yeah, so I tested it. Like, I have the WaveShare version. Mm -hmm. So just, like, the breakout of it. And, and I did get it working. Yeah, there's an ASAP 7-inch um, repository for it. Okay. So you should be able to just use it with the Pico W firmware in the library. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, that has all the initialization code too. But the P like Jeff's getting at the supporting a PSRAM is a lot, a lot, a lot more work. Okay. Um, which you only really need if you're going to do like drawing commands to a buffer that's the whole size. Uh, um, project that brought this on was trying to display a um, full month of Google Calendar data. Um, yeah, so you probably you might be okay if you do like a, a terminal IO or a tile grid. Mm -hmm. Terminal IO is probably the easiest way to do it. But that way you're not storing every single bit you're just storing. Yeah, I mean, this is what display IO is designed for is is not having to store the full frame buffer, but instead all the objects that you need. Yeah. The, um, so maybe like bitmap label would be better as well. The clever technique that um, Tim came up with was to run something on your computer that converts it to a bitmap and then push the bitmap over Wi-Fi and display the yeah. bitmap instead, um, which, right. like I said, terribly clever. Um, right. Yep. And would avoid a lot of the problems that would require PS RAM. Right. And that's what Tim is saying is like, does on disk bitmap need to store in RAM? And the answer is no. It just you know, read the bits out of off the flash that it needs to send over as it sends it over. Okay. And and the Pico W would have enough to deal with this? Like enough space? I, I don't think it has a flash chip on it, does it? Uh its flash chip is pretty small. Okay. I think it's only two. It's two total. Yeah, I think you get about 500k for your CircuitPy drive, maybe 700k on the Pico W. But that should accommodate a, a bitmap. Yeah, and plus the, it, um, it also, uh, it's only seven colors. So it's not going to be a full color bitmap either. Right. You're going to use four, bit, four, four bits a pixel. Um, it also has an SD card, so you could do that as well. Huh. Um, it doesn't have external flash, but it does have SD cards, so you sh you could download off the of Wi-Fi and write to write to the SD card. Uh, okay. Directly. Gotcha. And you could, yeah, you could, you could, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it because SD cards should work with it, with on disk bitmap. Whereas, like, if you Maybe. had a if you had a regular library that did the PSRAM for you, you'd have to do that all yourself. Mm. Um, although you could probably use it as a temporary file system. Oh, because it clears when... Right, right. like you could actually... Yeah, you could put a file system on the external PSRAM hmm. and store okay. it there temporarily and then treat it like a on a disk bitmap, but... 
that's not going to be any faster than that's not going to be any faster than reading it off an SD card. Like you're not going to get any speed advantage to using the PS RAM. Right. Okay. Uh, so I would just go, I would go SD card and I'm just about to get in the web workflow SD card support too. So you'd be able to manually copy them over if you wanted to as well. Okay. If retired wizard is correct, speed is not really an issue for e-ink. Right. Yeah. Because e-ink oh. refreshes are really slow, and the ASAP ones in particular for the seven color is very slow. Gotcha. Like it's like thirty. It's like thirty seconds. So you're gonna update every fifteen minutes or more. Yeah, I was gonna say even more than that. I assume. Um, uh, yeah, I'm curious about this because I just got the thirteen point three inch working as well but it's only two color gotcha um well i will keep you posted um the MicroPython examples that uh tim just listed or tim just linked to i will take a look at as well um but i'll yeah, see what, I mean, what you could always do a project it. in MicroPython. you you don't I have to <laughs> just use circuit python i know i don't have to Oh, we appreciate that you think of us first. Um, so yeah, okay. Um, so I'll I'll take a look at what they're like, how they're supporting the PS RAM, like in general, because I guess I'm genuinely curious now, given that given that you're explaining how it would work to implement it in in, in Circuit Python or not work. Um, I'm genuinely curious at this point how they're doing it. Um, so I will look into that and I will let folks know because I don't know anybody else wants to know. Um, and this is good information. Um, I will, st I will, oof. I'm terrible at merging, uh, <laughs> merging old stuff into new stuff, but I will try to get that, at least get that PR up to date because it's got merge conflicts right now. And then um, I'll see if I can get it going uh, once I have the board and I'll start from there. Cool. All right. Come back and ask us when you are when you got more questions. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you. Yeah, you could do the. Did sorry, I missed the last thing you said. But uh, you, I would start with just the Pico W firmware, and okay. the library I linked you to. Oh, okay. Instead of trying to get this PR going. Okay. 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 I gotcha. Just treat it like a Pico W, and then. Then you'll have the pin devs for the Pico W, so you'll have to figure out like how they match up. But oh, then you're okay. not stuck in recompiling C land. Yeah, exactly. To get and, the board dev working. Right, and I don't know. Like I, I know how to do a board def. I don't know how to do like redoing another person's code as much. Um, so right. I guess I will start there. And so what you're saying is just that that at that point I don't have board dot display. I have to do like import display IO blah blah blah. Right. And okay. let me see if I it looks like there's an example in here. Yeah, there's a simple test. Okay. Um so you'll just have to replace the the pin mapping. Gotcha. So I just have to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. That I will look at the. Um, I will look at the. Um, what am I trying to say? The existing PR. <laughs> I'll look at the existing PR and see whether the pins actually ma match up. Yeah, you could get the pins from there. The like the the process of getting it on board display is copying over like the initialization sequence and it's pro. If that doesn't work, then maybe that was just miscopied or something. But okay. The the thing that I tested was this library. So not the not because I don't have an e keyframe, so I didn't test the board def. Oh, oh, I'm, I see what you're saying. So you tested that it that, like the display worked, but you couldn't test the board definition in that in that pull request. Right. So I like tested it with like the the think ink feather instead. Okay. All right. Yeah. I I guess I will try both of these things. I'll also just grab an asset off of the um. Off of the pull request and see whether. It sure. you know happens to already work, right? Um, yep. And we Good. can go from there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That clears up um, most of my questions for now. 
uh, I'm sure there will be more. Thank you. All right, thanks. And Justin, thank you for your patience. Um, why don't you tell us about PyCharm stubs? Yeah, th this is again something that happened from a user on um, in Discord. I was like, I've been a huge PyCharm user for a long time. And so I've been handwriting some, some of my own stubs just because I like to know what the pins are. Um, and so they're asking and I sent them to them and I was like, there's gotta be a better way to do it. And it was like on a weekend. And so I was like, why not? And so I played with it and was able to go through the pins.c and build a, you know, a script that would create all of the stubs. So unique stubs for all of the boards that are in the repo. Um, and so kind of the question now is at this point is a, like, I'm happy to just leave it where it is at this point, and people can post it if ever anybody wants it, or if it's if there's some way to build this into the product at some point. Um, I did ping um, PyBi to find out if there was any rate limits. I didn't find any posted, but obviously sending 5,000 boards um, up to PyBi for releases could be a bit intense. Um, I'd also had thoughts of trying to figure out if we wanted to build the stubs to have a um, command line interface where you could actually, after you do the pip install, you could configure it for a board. And so all the boards would be like a subdirectory and it would copy and overwrite the board.py. Um, and so it's kind of, first question is, is this an avenue again that you guys want to go down? Um, and if so, um, some general guidance of how you might want to see that happen. Uh, I wonder if thought that occurred to me after you first talked about this, um, sometime subsequently it occurred to me, um, you could make, I don't know how this works in PyCharm, uh, or VS code for that matter, but you could consult an environment variable because I mean, stubs files are still kind of Python files and you, you seem to be able to write conditional statements in there. And so you could have one like master file, which conditionally imports the correct one based on, for instance, the environment. I don't know if that actually works. This is just based on my mental model of stubs. Um, yeah, so in theory, you could have a big if, it would be a, a ginormous if this block mm -hmm. that would import this thing. So I just like, I'm just trying to figure out how that would work because so I guess the board.py would be nothing, but an also imports probably star from another file. Um, yes, that's the general idea of what I was envisioning. Now the question is, you know, does that work? Can you put that in a PYI stubs file and have PyCharm treated in the correct way? And then second, do people using these tools, would they understand what it would mean to say, set the environment variable equal to the name of your board? Um, because, yeah, I, I think in environment variables coming from the background that I do, but other people wouldn't necessarily. And I don't know, you know, is there something that facilitates doing that within the GUI of these programs? Yeah, I know they can for tests and things. I don't know. I'd have to play around with it to see otherwise. That's kind of why I had thought of a, you do a pip install and then whatever board you're working for at that time, you would basically go, you know, something like Adafruit stubs, you know, dash dash select board and then put in the name and it would just copy that file over the board, you know. And I think, I think it was Foamy guy that mentioned it, I believe of having like the default one, if you install it, could be all of the pins. And so every pin was available. So that way you'd have high level autocomplete. And if you wanted to, like that one could get overridden if you're like, oh, I'm doing something with this specific board. I want to do this. Like I often have that. I have ends for hundreds of projects for different boards. And so for me, that's easy. But again, I'm a long time developer and it's simple for me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look with PyCharm and VS Code to see if you can have an environment variable that would run while it's 
trying to use the stubs. Yeah. In, in PyCharm, I know you can. There's a setting for it somewhere to add environment variables kind of at your sort of project, um, project run level, which I think would work for this. Okay, and do you know if you can with VS Code? I, I um, use VS Code for a lot of things, but I I literally use it more like a text editor than anything yeah. else. And so I don't actually ever like that I don't have specific stuff installed or anything like that. Yeah, I would guess that there is. If nothing else, there's a terminal, and you can obviously set var environment variables with the terminal. Um, but I don't actually know on the VS Code side of things. I've only really used it for one sort of stint learning a, a specific project, and it, it didn't stick as my primary uh, editor, which is PyCharm. Do you guys have a feeling of one like environment variable versus like a command line, uh, basically use this stub, um, like swap out for this stub? Like is there uh, like... I I like the environment variable. I mean, I, honestly, I think of them as almost the same anyway, because there's a, there's certainly a command line exporter or something like that that would set the variable for you. Um, so you could kind of think of it as a command either way. But I would say I'm not super strongly uh, opinionated. I know lots of stuff uses environment variables, so it seems like a, a good thing for us to just kind of ride the coattails of. Um, but I also wouldn't say that I care that much too strongly which way whether it's a command or a, an environment variable but I do I would say my my stronger uh, opinion is more around the fact of it when you install it by default you get all the boards and then you do something whatever it is run the command or set the environment variable in order to hone in on your specific board um, that way it's kind of installable and usable right out of the gate to the majority of people um, but then if you know you're on one specific project, you can narrow it down further to exclude the pins that aren't actually on that board. Okay. And kind of the reason I ask of one way versus the other is which tack to try to spend my time on first to see if I can get to work in both cases. So um, like if many people think environment variable sounds good, I'm happy to start going down that route to see, you know, whether or not that's you know feasible. Um, it's not like it's going to take a lot of time um yeah okay. i would be tempted to you know kind of do a survey there there are two pieces of software to survey and you can freely install them both and just see is setting an environment variable something that is like just fairly easy or is it extremely hidden in one or the other of them um, okay yeah i'll definitely look at that and did you generate like i had that thought and realized i wouldn't want to have to update the code specifically in the stub every time. And so whatever the environment variable, it would just tack that as the file name. So it would just assume, you know, if someone released the butterboard, it would just go look for the, you know, boards, extra butterboard or whatever. And it wouldn't, I just, I realized that after I said like this, I was thinking of this if block that's 500 things long. I was like, that's just not gonna work. So like just, whether you're setting it for command line as an export, it would just take the value and use that to grab that to, particular to file. To find something to import from, yeah. Yeah. So if you type it wrong, then you would just get no pins. Right. Yep. And then as far as updating, there wouldn't really be any additional work when it comes time to update because it's parsing from pins.c, which is already getting merged in. So, And then actions, I assume, somewhere will run this and actually do the upload to PyPy and everything like it does today. So um, there shouldn't be, as far as I understand it, there won't be any manual step whenever new devices come in. Uh, once we get things set up, they'll just kind of get populated uh, automatically like the stubs do today. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things I was going to play with on my side, and I'm happy to add this in, is like, all these boards have all these different defaults. Um, like I was working on something for, you know, I've forgotten the name of it, but there's a little bit of RAM that you can write to. Um, in VM, maybe? Yep, that one. And like actually putting those things in the stubs where like if you're just looking at code, you could go look at the stub and go, oh, like this is how much of this I have, or, you know, this is, you know, here are some of the settings and things like that. Um, like even like how many sockets are available or something like that. Um, so obviously I'll go down this first route, but like even just having some high level comments that say, 
here's, you know, and other ones were like, these are the libraries, these are the frozen libraries and things like that. Um, I thought it could just be really handy to have it all in one page and go parse all that stuff out. So um, I might play with that a little bit as well. Cool. Sounds very good to me for sure. Awesome. Well, that's what I got today. All right. Thank, Thank you, Randall. <laughs> Well, that wraps up the meeting for today. I um, just want to thank everybody who participated. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for January 22nd, 2024. It's, uh, I think, the first time in a while that we've gone over 60 minutes, and I, I appreciate everybody taking the time to be with us today. Um, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us who work on CircuitPython, considering per consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting is regularly released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and then it's taken from there and made a podcast available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the next Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held as usual on Monday, January 9, 2024 at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord. You can join any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. The meeting is held uh, in the CircuitPython dev channel and the CircuitPython voice channel, but you can talk about cool electronic stuff 24 seven with people all over the world. Uh, anyway, but back to the meeting, to be notified about meeting changes to the time or day or to speak during the meeting, uh, ask to be added to the CircuitPythonista's role on discord. It's free, we're happy to give you the role, and uh, we'd love it if you participated with us. We hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>